start with uh, table three here. Um, find f of zero. Alex, what you get for that? Three. So when we see f of zero, what are, what are we actually finding in terms of uh, visually from the graph? What are we actually finding when we find f of zero? Yeah. Uh, where x equals 0, y equals 3. So what is that point zero three called? The y-intercept. So right. So remember, your input is 0. And your output is 3. So that corresponds to what we traditionally have been calling the y-intercept. Now the next question asks a different question. It's saying... For what values of x, in other words, what values of my input, and notice it has plural here, what values of my input is my output 0? Okay, so now that's asking us to find the what? The x-intercepts, right. So this is really asking us to find what we traditionally, or what we more... Um, you know, what we traditionally call the x-intercepts. And if we look at our graphs, graph here, we can see that the output is 0 at two places, negative 3 and positive 2. So, so you've, you've got to kind of keep, um, you know, this is new notation for many of you. So when your input is zero, just imagine you're sitting right at, you know, uh, initially right where x is zero, which is right somewhere you're going to be along that y-axis, that's your y-intercept. When the output is zero, when f of x equals zero, you're sitting somewhere on your horizontal axis or your x-intercept. Now, we do have a new change in language with functions. We say that negative 3 and 2 are the zeros of the function f, since these are the x values where your output is 0. Okay? So we now, will, now you might hear the language, what are the zeros of your function? Okay? And that means you're setting your function equal to 0. If you had your equation for the function, you would set your equation equal to 0. So if this was a parabola, you would set your parabola equal to 0, y would be 0, and that's what you're used to solving when we solve a quadratic equation. So when you solve a quadratic equation for 0, if it has real number answers, you are finding the zeros of that function. Okay, so let's take a look at today's information. We talked um, at the end of Friday about the domain and range of this um, function right here. We spent a little bit of time. I gave you some extra questions about it. And we talked about the domain and range of this function in the context of the height of a baseball over time. So in that context, this function had a restricted domain. The domain of this function in the context of the story started at x equals 0 and finished somewhere, I think we found that that x-intercept of the zero here to be, what, 5.03 or something, or 5.04 on Friday? So in this particular story, the domain, the domain is restricted. We say the domain is restricted. And, and it goes from zero to, I think, 5.03 or 4, we'll say. The range is also restricted here. The range of this particular function starts at 3, and the highest point, actually that's not true, because if, we, if you look at the beginning, you're going to get the answer wrong, because at the very end, the ball's back on the ground. So the smallest height of the function is right here at 0, and it goes as high as 103 feet. So the range is restricted as well by the context of the story. If we just look at the function f of x equals negative 16x squared plus 80x plus 3, without any story behind it, 
this is a quadratic function. It, it's a graph of a parabola. And this parabola continues to go down and down and down forever and ever. So when you look at a, a quadratic function, there's no restriction on your domain. Your domain can be any real number. So on this function without the story, the domain would be all real numbers. And the range would go from negative infinity up to 103. That would be the highest value. So you have to sometimes think about, am I looking at just a function? Am I looking at a particular situation? Like if I gave you, um, like if I created a table of um, the weight of a letter and how much it costs for postage on the letter, there would be certain intervals, um, like more than an ounce, less than an ounce and a half, whatever they do at the post office, but there's a final amount, like three and a half ounces. So you would have a restriction on your domain. Okay, so let's talk about visually domain and range. Um, we've got a nice little visual here for it. So this is from your book. The graph of a function f of x is graphed. Where does this function, does this function have a beginning and an end here? Does it have a beginning and an end? Yeah, it starts right here. I don't know what that point is. We, we could give it a name if we wanted. Let's call it... Uh, Let's call it 2, 3. And it ends right here. Let's call that 8, 7. All right, just for the heck of it. So if I were to ask you what the domain of this function is, what would you tell me? What would you tell me is the domain of this, of, of f, the function f? Okay, we need a little more than 2 comma 8 because what is a domain in a range? Set, 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 set. It's a set. So however you represent it, you always have to have some kind of set notation. So 2 comma 8 is not a set notation. So what else could I do with the 2 comma 8 to make it be a set of num all the numbers from 2 to 8? Brackets, right. Interval notation. You'll find interval notation is very often used, and this is what we use in my math lab to look at domain and ranges. What about the range of f? Is there a smallest output value? What's the smallest output value here? Three, right here, right? If we go over, it would be at three. We're making these numbers up, of course. And is there an upper value, like a ceiling for the of of the uh, function? Yeah. Well, it's not quite seven because seven is below this point up here, right? So it would be whatever would be the value of this point right here, right? This would be your upper value. Let's call that six comma eight. So let's say it goes from 3 to 8. Okay. But 7 would have been like the, the typical answer because you're used to looking at the domain. So notice, you can see on here, you can't see it on your paper, you see how the domain has this sort of blue-gray color? Your domain would be if you took every single one of these input values and you came down, I mean, I, obviously I can't, oops, I'm not supposed to say obviously, but... I can't take every single input value because there's an infinite number of numbers between 2 and 8. But you can see that if I colored the horizontal axis, which is called your x-axis, with all the numbers, and notice how we have our brackets right here from 2 to 8, that would be my domain. And if I took all the output values starting with 3 and going all the way up, to this maximum value here, that would be my range. So um, one of my colleagues, um, Ian uh, Winokur, he did a really nice um, geometry sketch pad to show you um, domain and range. And this is what I always think about when I think of domain and range. I actually think of this animated. Um, so here's a function. Notice it's in two pieces. It looks like a. Um, a line segment from A to C, 
and assume that those little um, open circles there are really colored in. It's just an artifact of the ge geometry sketch pad that puts like little open circles. So in your mind right now, um, maybe you could try to think about what you think the domain of this function is. Okay, see if you com can think about what the domain might be. Notice your domain is going to be for this piece of the function and then this piece. All right. So let's visually see what the domain is. I love this animation. Isn't that cool? Okay. So how would you describe the domain here? What would you actually say? Can anybody tell me where the domain starts? Other than Gabe? Two. So what do I have to do? Are we including two? Yeah, so we come right down here. So I'm going to put my bracket, right, for my interval notation, and put the number 2, because that's at x equals 2. And how far does this first piece go in terms of my x values? Up to 6, right. So here we go. We got brackets there at 6. Okay, so it goes from 2 to 6, and then it takes a little break, right? Notice that, there's an, that we don't have our pink line right there. Right? We don't, we're not, this function isn't defined for the numbers between 6 and 7. It's empty there. Okay? So now I put my union symbol, and now I put my next, the next set in my domain, which starts at 7. And where does it end? 15. Okay. So that's how I would represent this domain. It's, it's over two different intervals. It's the interval 2 to 6, including both endpoints, together with, which we, when we get together, when we reunite, we do a union, U for union, 7 to 15. So that's our domain. Okay, let's think about our range. Let's see the visual for the range. Um, oh, I forgot I can't erase here. So let's take a look at our range. So the range is the output. Okay, so you try at your seats writing what you think the range of this function is. Ashley, what do you have? Yeah. Negative 2, comma 2.5. Anything else you want to add to that? Brackets, okay. Okay, then the U, 4, 6. How's that sound, folks? Pretty good? I agree. And then the other thing that this um, particular uh, anim little animation does is it does the vertical line test. And you can see that as I move this vertical line from right to left, it's only touching my function at one and only one spot, which means... When x is 3, I have one and only one output, 4 and a half. That's what defines a function. Okay? So no matter, you sweep, whenever you're doing a vertical line test, you sweep the vertical line across your paper from left to right or right to left. And whenever it hits your function in just one place, you know you have a function. Okay. So let's take a look at the rest of... Um, all right, so now we have what might be uh, a more typical function that you might see for a homework problem. It's, it's a function. Uh, we don't have the equation for it, um, but let's use, um, let's find the domain, which remember in your mind when you think about the domain, think about that animation coming down from picking a bunch of points from your graph and either coming down to the x-axis or up to the x-axis, depending on if your curve is above or below the x-axis. So in your mind, imagine those little arrows coming down. And where am I going to stop my arrows? Never. In what direction? Positive infinity, right. So 
when we talk about domain and range, remember you're always describing a set of numbers. So use interval notation to represent the domain. So given that my first point here was a closed circle, I'm going to start with bracket and put negative 7, comma, but there's no end point. There's no final x value. It goes all the way to positive infinity. Okay? And again, you would be coloring this x-axis forever and ever and ever out to positive infinity. So now let's take a look at the domain, the range, which is all of our output values. Okay, and we'll use interval notation. So let's see, do we have a low point in this function? What is that low point? Negative two. Remember, now we're going over to the y-axis, and we start. We're going to start with negative two. So we're going to put a bracket there, and we're going to start coloring upward. And where do I stop? Six. Why? All right. So the initial idea was six because we see that point negative seven six. So that's a good first guess. But don't forget because the x axis, the domain continues forever and ever. That means this thing continues forever and ever. So what are we ever going to stop on our y axis here? No. So our range would go from negative two to positive infinity. So that's the domain and range of that particular function. Any questions on domain and range? OK. So for this particular part, we're going to, you're going to do a lot more work um, with this uh, in your group activities. This particular idea of even and odd functions will be with you for the rest of the semester. It's also one of those topics that students have a really hard time with. And it's not so much the idea of what makes a function even and odd. It's showing that a function is even and odd. And it has a lot to do with your new notation. Okay, So let's take a look at what it first means to be an even function, and then We'll look at the property and see how we would prove that a function is even. All right, so the first idea of an even function is that it's symmetric about the y-axis. Okay, and that means that if you took your y-axis and you folded this graph in, in half right along that y-axis, every point on the right side of the graph would have a corresponding point at exactly the same height, either above or below the graph, as the point on the left side. Right? That's the idea of an even function. How do we show it? Well, this is the property. This is what you have to show. And let's take a look at what the, what the symbols say, and then we'll try to figure out if we can make sense of it. It says, f of the opposite of x, f of the opposite of x, whatever that value is when I take, the, when I evaluate the function at the opposite of x, it's exactly the same as the value of the function f of x. The output values are exactly the same. So what that means, and you can, I have one point, two points listed here. If I go over on my graph to the right to x equals 2 and a half, I come down to the value negative 14.44. Right? That's my point, 2 and a half, negative 14.44. If I decide to go in the opposite direction, the same amount, which is called the opposite of x, I go out to negative two and a half. Notice my output is exactly the same. I'm exactly the same distance below the x-axis. Okay. So let's let's fill in our table here for a couple of more values. All right. So here's our function. All right. There's showing symmetry, even symmetry. 
if I take a value x and I find its output, this output right here is called f of x. That's at exactly the same distance below as when I look at f of the opposite of x. So let's show some specific coordinates now. So let's, um, let's move this thing. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. Okay. All right, so here's two more points you could put in your table, but let's find some more points. Let's do something above the x-axis. How about right there? There we go. So here, x is a little bit bigger than a half, 0.58. It's 5.75 above the x-axis. If I go the same distance to the left at negative 5.8, it's at exactly the same height. So you can fill that value in your table now. Okay, so let's see. For a table, we had um, positive 0.58 and negative 0.58, and we were at exactly the same height above the table. So even though we changed our x values to opposite, the outputs are the same. We're focusing on the outputs when we change inputs to opposite values. What do the outputs look like? They're exactly the same. Okay, let's take a look at another one. We play this game all day. Let's see, I gotta get to the right picture though. All right, so let's move this again. Um, let's move it, oops, all the way out, way out here. Let's see, way up there. Oh, I can't even see that. Uh, well, I know I know what the answer is because if I can see its positive value, I can see its opposite. So there at negative 3.2 and positive 3.2, notice your inputs are opposite, but what can you tell me about the outputs? They're equal. That will always happen whenever you have a function that you can fold along the y-axis. Outputs are the same, even when we try to force the inputs to be opposite. So 3.2 and it's 11.46. So we go to our table. When it's 3.2 and we take its opposite, we get exactly the same output. Okay. Well, we could do this all day long because there's an infinite number of x values on this graph. Okay, because this graph continues to positive infinity. Okay. So our domain for this graph is all x values, and our range would go from negative 14.44, or whatever this lowest point is here, we don't know yet, all the way to positive infinity, right? So I can't prove that this is even by just picking out some numbers. This is what I want to show. I want to show that if I take the opposite of x and evaluate my function, find its output, and that's what f of the opposite of x says, are my outputs equal? Are outputs equal when I input opposites? That's what all that means. I know it looks a little funky at first, but it just says, are my outputs the same when I put in inputs? So let's go back and let's get the equation for this function, and we'll figure out how to show it for all for all values of x, not just the six that we just picked. So here's my function. Help me remember this, x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus nine. All right, so here we go. This is how we would prove that this function is even. So we take its equation. Is that right? Okay, all right. Do you see that we already know what f of x equals? It's x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus nine. So look, this is what I'm trying to prove, that f of x is the same as f of its opposite, that the two outputs are the same. I already know what f of x equals. It's this right-hand expression. f of x for all values of x is x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 9. You give me a number, I'll plug it in for x here. So this is how you prove that a function has even symmetry. You can't just throw a number in. You've got to show it for all values of x. Okay, so this is like a little proof. So you say, okay, I can just take this, 
Here's f of x, and scoot it right down there. x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 9. I've done half of the work already. Now, how do I evaluate f of the opposite of x? Wherever I see x, I replace it with the opposite of x. So I'm going to go in now, and wherever I see x in my original function, I'm going to replace it with the opposite of x. Here's the opposite of x. Whenever I have opposite of x, and I'm raising it to an even power, I better put it in parentheses, to the fourth minus 10 times the opposite of x squared plus 9. So now here's the question of the hour. Does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side? And if the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, your outputs are exactly the same, which means you're even. All right. So how do we figure out what this thing is? How do we figure out how to do that thing to evaluate it? What do we do? Okay, so we could say the opposite of x times the opposite of x times the opposite of x times the opposite of x. What's that give me? Lucas? x to the fourth. What happened to all those dashes? Why? What do you mean by cancel each other out? So when you say cancel out, what does it become? And how do you know you're going to get positive here? Even exponent. Because what's the number that's really right here in front of x, folks? Nope. If it was 1, it would just say x. Negative 1. Okay. So if we use our exponent property... We raise the number to the fourth power in the variable, we get this, negative 1 to the fourth, and there, there it is, 4 times, and x to the fourth is the same as 1x to the fourth. Or we simply call it x to the fourth. Okay, so when we have the opposite of x to the fourth, you say, yippee, it's an even power. That's exactly the same as x to the fourth. Minus 10, oops, we got another one of those dash x's raised to a power, but it's even, so that's going to stay the same as x squared plus 9. Does the left side equal the right side? Yep. So this shows that this is an even function. Okay. So your outputs are equal. So you'll always be given half of your equation to prove because you'll always be given the function itself. Okay, you're going to have a lot of time to practice this in your homework, I mean, in your group activities. But any questions before I move on with anything? All right, let's take a look at an odd function. An odd function is symmetric about the origin. So that means that if you go to the right a certain distance, call it x, and in this case, to the left a certain distance, call it the opposite. So notice we're still dealing with opposite inputs. It means that the distance from the origin to the point is the same to the output. The distance from the origin to your point, your output, is exactly the same. The difference is that the outputs aren't equal anymore. What are they? The outputs are opposite, right? And this is how you write it. Notice it says, if I find the output of the opposite of x, Right here, negative 12.13. It's the opposite of f of x. And that's exactly what that says. If I find the output of my function at the opposite of x, it's the opposite value. So now your outputs are opposite values. They're not equal. Outputs are opposite. So just focus on the idea of the outputs. Outputs are opposite. So let's take a look at a couple more values of this function. We can fill in the table here. So i got to find that function. I think it's this one. Does that look like the function you have at your table? OK. And so let's here's, here's a value right here, negative 3.2. You can fill in your chart. 
you can put 3.2 for x and negative 3.2 for the second x. Fill it right in. And what do we know about their outputs? One is 7.12 and the other one is negative 7.12. So notice this output is the opposite of that output. That's exactly how you read this. This output is the opposite of this output. Seven point, negative 7.12 is the opposite of 7.12. And let's fill in one more value here. I'm going to change this up. Oh, let's come up here. Here we go. 3 point, point 0.35 and negative 0.35 you can put in your chart. And what are the outputs? Opposite. 0.35 has an output of 7.8. Its opposite, negative 0.35, has its negative 0.78. Outputs are opposite. So here's your function, 25x over x squared plus 1. Let's prove it. So you filled in the table. Uh, what was it? 25x squared over x squared plus 1. Is that, tr is that right? Uh, let's see. That's 25x. Okay. So I was going to say, if, if it was x squared, it wouldn't be odd. Okay. So here we go. How do we prove this? This is what we have to show. That when we look at opposite values of x, the outputs are opposite. So output is opposite. See that big dash out in front. So let me put in f of x. I'm always going to be given part of my equation. f of x is 25x over x squared plus 1. And now i got to put that dash out front. doesn't matter whether you put the dash out front in the top or the bottom. So I'm just going to put it right there out front. Now, what is f of the opposite of x? Well, I take my function and I throw a negative, an opposite of x in wherever I see x. So I have 25, and instead of x, I put the opposite of x over the opposite of x squared plus 1. So here we go. We're going to write what each one of these things represents. Here's my right side. Now, what's my left side become? 25 times negative 1x is negative 25x. And the opposite of x squared, it's an even power, is the same as x squared. Are those two things equal? Yep. So now you've proved that it's odd because the outputs are opposite. So the conclusion here is that for an even function, when we have opposite values of x, the outputs are exactly the same. The y values are the same. For an odd function, when we have opposite values of x, the outputs are opposite of each other. Okay. And so we've gone through two examples, and you'll be doing more of this in your group activities. So I think we're all set now for your class activities. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be glad to help you out.